Hey church, uh, this is Pastor Ron here and I just want to thank you for the warm welcome and uh, it's great to be a part of the Sunrise family. And today we're dealing with a lot of struggles, a lot of hard times. You know, we have the fires going on and the political climate and all so many things that make us feel hopeless. But one thing that I can hold on to and I hope you can too is what God has set out for us, what God, how God takes care of us and the love of Christ that we get to feel and we get to share with one another. Today, we're gonna to be talking about Ephesians 5. We're gonna be talking about being imitators of God and taking comfort in knowing that God is there for us. So enjoy and have a blessed Sunday.
to worship God. Sometimes I feel like I don't deserve to be in his presence. You know, it's an exchange. It's an ex exchange. As we worship, things happen in our lives. And sometimes I feel like I don't deserve that. But isn't he merciful? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he great? That in his mercy and his grace, he finds it to allow us, allow us to give him all of the honor and all of the glory. And as we worship, man, it's like we're in a different world. I encourage you. Maybe you haven't felt God's presence in a while. He's there right where you're at. He's here. He's in our midst. Because he loves us. Why don't we sing how much we need him? Let's sing about how we want him to be in our lives every single moment, every single day. Not just a song, but a prayer.
choosing us to represent you everywhere we go. God, allow us and help us be the light 
Give us grace. Give us favor. And I just pray that anyone who needs to hear hope in their lives, I pray that you would send someone to them right now in Jesus' name. That you would send us in Jesus' name. We love you. We bless you. We give you all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. What a super awesome worship set that was. We are so blessed to have you join us this morning. Also, just a quick reminder that you can still give to Sunrise Community Fellowship. It'll be on the screen here. You can give in three different ways via text. You can also go to our website and give that way, or you can also mail to our P.O. Box. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. And now let's listen to the sermon from Pastor D. Have a blessed day. Well, thank you, worship team. Another awesome worship set. I love that song. And it goes right with what I'm speaking about and what we've been talking about these last few weeks was we've been going through the book of Ephesians. Paul is telling us that we don't have to go back to that old life. As we walk in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, we don't have to look back. We can look forward. We can allow the presence and power of the Holy Spirit of God to see us through. And I realize, and in, in, in my goal through this whole series on Ephesians is, is I really wanted us to begin to develop some new spiritual growth habits as, in the way that we all read the Word of God together as a church, and that you come prepared for each sermon by reading along the week before. And so I'm excited about the feedback that I've been getting so far, and I just want to encourage you, even right now, open your Bibles up to the book of Ephesians. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 5 tonight, and uh, there's so much. And I know that in a series like that, I just have to pick and choose and kind of skim over different parts as I feel led to share. Uh, but we don't worry, we will definitely be revisiting the book of Ephesians lots of different times uh, over during our time together. God is so awesome. Well, we know last week as we finished up the sermon, we talked about that we are to wear the virtues like we wear clothes every day. The virtues, what are the virtues? The virtues that Paul presented in chapter four for us that we are to live out our new identity, just as the worship team had just been singing about. That we're a new creation in Christ and we're to do it for the good of others and the glory of God. We're to promote unity and love. And we know that we cannot do any of these things on our own. That's why God fills us with the Holy Spirit. So let's focus on the things that build us up, not the selfish things of the world that destroy. And even right now in this very time, there's so many crazy things going on that it's hard for us to even conceptualize in our minds how people deal with things and how we move uh, through our lives. And I don't know how people do it without God. Can't do it. Let's dive right in here to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. Imitate. What does that word imitate mean? It means to take or follow as a model. The issue is that we've got to make sure that we know who we're imitating. Who is it that we are patterning our life after? Is it God? Is it the world? See, the Christian has no greater calling or purpose than imitating their Lord. See, that is the very purpose of sanctification, growing in likeness to the Lord while serving him here on earth. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, God's high standards for his children. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Paul opens chapter 5 with one of the greatest challenges in the word of God. The pattern for a Christian is to live life like God himself. I don't know about you, but thankfully God grants us his grace because none of us are perfect. But as God's children, we are to walk through life imitating God as best we can for his purposes and plans for our lives. See, God said to Moses, say to the entire assembly of Israel, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. See, what Paul is sharing with us in Ephesians started way back, a long time ago, way back in the beginning 
of time. Here was Moses with the children of Israel being delivered out of Egypt. We see also earlier in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, God said, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. See, what God is saying is that if you're going to be my children, you need to totally dedicate and consecrate yourself to me. And why does God do that? God had created us. He created us to be in relationship with him. He created us to be his children. And he knows what's best for us. And so as we live this journey and we're on this life, as we move forward, we need to take a good hard look at God's expectations for our life. And that's what Paul is sharing with us in Ephesians. I mean, just think about it. There is no moral boundaries without God. And we can see how chaos can soon get out of control when the things of God are not followed. So also we see Jesus speaking into this. And in John chapter 6 is a great chapter in God's word of of Jesus at work. And Jesus feeds the 5,000. And then we see Jesus walking on water. And then the next day the people realize that Jesus is on the other side of the lake. And so they do everything they can to get in front of Jesus again. Why? Well, not because they want to be with him. No, because they want to see more miracles. They want to uh, basically let Jesus put on a show. But when they get there, Jesus says, no, this isn't what it's all about. This is about a relationship with me. I mean, he goes so far to say that if you, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and man, they all freaked out and goes, what is he talking about? But he wasn't talking about doing that physically. He was foreshadowing, obviously, for the Last Supper and communion and what that's all going to be about. But his point was that this is about being one with him, being one with him. See, Jesus lays it out very clearly. See, the work of God is to believe in the one God has sent. Eternal life is that total union with Christ, believing in Christ and living for him. One of Paul's main themes throughout this book of Ephesians is walking in and with the Spirit of God. And then we see Jesus saying in verse 63 of John 6, he says, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is our example to follow. As we get back here to Ephesians chapter one, I just, I mean, chapter five, verse one and two, I wanted to lay out a little foundation there for us. But we're to be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. See, we're to walk in love, is what Paul is telling us. We're to walk in love, love like the Father. See, the love of the Father, see, we are adopted as his children. We share in the love of the Father has for the Son. As believers, we now show God's fatherly love by great acts of compassion and mercy. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. See, we should be known as Christians, brothers and sisters, for our acts of mercy and compassion. And then Paul tells us that we need to walk in love, love like the Son, in that power of love that Jesus had. See, to understand the love of a father, we look to Jesus as our model. He is where we have, here is where we have to be honest. We all fall short consistently in our love for others. We battle with the flesh. We battle with selfishness. We battle with these things. It sounds good, but it's hard. See, we have to battle with the selfishness of the flesh. See, we would be crushed today under the weight of guilt if it were not for the cross of Jesus Christ. And then we see the pattern of love that involves giving ourselves away for the good of another. Love is just not sentimentalism. It's not just merely feeling sorry for someone. No, it involves sacrifice and action. How can we grow in love for others when we're only thinking about ourselves? See, we must think on Christ and think about Christ's love for us. 
Did we deserve it? Do others deserve it? See, that's the point, isn't it? None of us deserve it. But we are to live it out in the pattern of Christ. Actually, John tells us in 1 John 3.23 that we are to love one another as Jesus himself commanded us to do. Love one another. And then we see that Christ's death was a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Notice Christ gave himself up for us, but it was an offering to God. So let, us be, let it be a holy fragrance of love in your life as we care or as you care for others, practically, sincerely, generously. And we do it all for the glory of God, not for our glory, but for his glory. Amy Carmichael, a longtime missionary to India, said, one can give without loving, but one cannot love without giving. Man, what a powerful statement. One can give without loving, but one cannot love without giving. She's talking about the motive of the heart. See, may God make us people that love others like Christ loves us. Again, it all comes down to the motive of our hearts. What we see as we move forward in verses 3 through 14 that we're to walk in the light. We're to exalt God by living morally pure. Verse 3 says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Note the importance of rejecting these sins. There must not even be a hint of these sins. Why? See, because fornication and covetousness are absolutely in contrast to God's holiness and love. See, the real issue here is sin. Sin is the root of greed and selfishness. And we see that greed, greed, greed drives and fuels selfishness. And selfishness drives and fuels greed. Next thing you know, they, you get all spun up in this desire, and you, it's all about, I want it, I need it, I deserve it, I've got to have it. I don't care what I do to anybody else, because it's all about me. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that seem like the battle that we're fighting right now in our world, in our nation, in our country? We are so consumed with the disease of me that we can't see out to what needs to happen for others. We can't sacrifice a little bit of our comfort so that someone else can be comfortable. And it breaks my heart when I see Christians that stand on their soapbox and get all righteous about themselves when they should be having an attitude of sacrifice and love for others. We have to be careful because what happens is we destroy our witness. People are looking at us all the time to see the love of Christ in and through us. But we can destroy our witness in a heartbeat. See, it's a mindset of destruction. Paul used the word hint here because it only takes a little thought. Then it can magnify into a huge situation or issue. And then it can become an addictive behavior. The real issue is none of these things, none of these things fit the character of God. We're to be Christ-like. We're children of the king. So important for us to take a look at, a hard look at these things. Verse 4 and 5 says, Nor should be there any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of of Christ and of God. Paul is laying it out here. He's saying, here's the deal. I mean, there's no doubt that this attitude toward immoral and all these things and persons is wrong. And again, it hurts our witness. And, and worse, it hurts other people. People need love. People need encouragement. People in the church, people in our families. I mean, one of the worst things that can happen is a family that goes to church on Sundays, but unfortunately there's a lot of strife in the home and there's not any love in the home. What do the kids see? What do the kids imitate? We're talking about imitating God here. We've got to be very careful. 
See, why is this person an idolater? Because their behavior exhibits a false image of who God is. It also puts the person's will above the will of God. This kind of behavior represents the creature of this world, not the creator, God, of this world. But see, the problem is, even as Christians, we have to be careful about what we feed ourselves. See, we can read this and we can see, yeah, it's not good for us, but then we allow ourselves to observe these things. We allow movies to come into our very homes. We allow our children to watch things that don't bring honor and glory to God. And I know you're probably saying, wow, Pastor Dean, you're being really hard. No, I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. We cannot allow ourselves to be caught up in all these things and just say, well, it's okay. You know, I know better. How do we know how things influence even those around us and especially our younger children? So important for us to understand that we have to be careful on what we feed ourselves. Destruction is everywhere, and the enemy is not giving up. As a matter of fact, I believe the closer we get to Jesus' return, that he's at work double time trying to get as many souls as he can. So Ephesians 5, verse 6 and 7 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on you. Those who are disobedient, therefore do not be partners with them. See, we see it happening, the increasing tolerance for immorality in our country, selfishness. I deserve to live how I want. But see, God has given us expectations for our life. See, because he knows the destruction that living out selfish desires causes. See, we have been warned Jesus' role model of what life guided by the Holy Spirit looks like. We have become a world that operates in justification. See, if we can get enough people to agree wrong is right, then it's okay. Uh oh, Pastor Dean's starting to get a little political there. No, I'm not getting political. The Word of God is the truth. And many people today are ignoring it. Many people today are pushing it aside, saying it's not relevant. Well, I want you to know that the Word of God is relevant. And the Word of God tells us that it will stand for all eternity. All eternity. And so just because a bunch of people agree that wrong is right doesn't mean it's right. We have the truth to guide our lives. See, we know that all that is based on what? On selfish sin. See, he's telling us not to partner here. Why? Because we have to be careful about influence. We know that one negative can bring down five positives. If we're able to influence a negative group, and that's great, and we're strong enough in our walk and mature enough in our walk with Christ, then that's important for us to do. But if we're not, we know that what usually happens is that negative influence brings down positives. And so we have to be careful and not to partner with those kind of people, but to try and role model and be a light to those kind of people. Verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. See, before we were saved, before we had a relationship with Jesus Christ, we walked in darkness. We, some of us didn't even know any better. Most people didn't know any better. But see, this whole thing is that now that Christ is in our lives, that we're to live as children of light. That means we can't allow darkness to come in. Now, are we perfect? No. When we mess up, we do. But the definition of Christian maturity is the amount of time it takes you to repent once you've fallen away from God. Because see, if you don't repent right away and you don't turn your life back away from this evil stuff and you just keep trucking along and keep being with it a little bit here and a little bit there, next thing you know, you're going to be overwhelmed. See, the real significance of life is hidden from those who are consumed with the flesh. The Bible tells us in lots of ways that even the thing of... Things of the cross are foolishness to, the, to those who do not believe. However, for the believer in Christ, the darkness is revealed in the light of God. Eternal life opens the heart and mind to God's purposes and significance of all things, now and for all eternity. Ephesians 5, verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We cannot allow ourselves to be deceived. It's so important for us to not allow ourselves to be deceived. And here it is. Paul lays it out here in verse 15 through 17. Be 
very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. He doesn't say they're going to be evil. Someday it's going to happen. No, the days were evil then, and the days are evil now, and the days will be evil until Jesus Christ returns and cleanses this whole place from unrighteousness. So here's the deal for us. We need to make the most of every opportunity. God gives us divine appointments to speak into other people's lives, divine appointments to be a light. We can't shy away from those. We have to be bold. We have to be strong in our walk. We have to share the hope that's within us. So important. So therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. See, unwise is the contrast between light and darkness, which Paul turns to the contrast between wisdom and foolishness. See, understanding of God's will comes through His Word. It gives us the spiritual understanding that we need. See, people need to be saved, spirit-filled, discipled, sanctified, loving, forgiving, and thankful. Because Jesus is our supreme example to follow. So we look at now the believer's responsibility. It is to walk in the light of Christ in accordance with his heavenly calling on our lives. Paul is encouraging us, the church of Jesus Christ, to grow in spiritual maturity, to maintain a walk of holiness as children of light in every relationship we have. He goes on in the rest of this chapter and talks about how it starts at home with wives and husbands and children should obey their parents. See, that we must all be transformed by this new life that we have in Christ Jesus because we are his witnesses for a hurting world that has been blinded by the darkness of God's enemy. We have a job. We have a responsibility. We have a calling. When we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, yes, salvation is free. But not only is it to to love the Lord, but it's to live for the Lord. And we have a calling that he's given us to live out for him. The believer's responsibility is to love Jesus Christ with our whole being. He said the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Paul, that just kind of summarizes all that Paul is telling us here. See, the real issue is surrender. We either surrender to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or we surrender to the world. See, last week we started the sermon in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, that we are to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. That we're to live a life worthy of the calling we have received. We see that Paul is not mincing words here. He's telling us how important it is for us to live as wise, not as unwise. We're to live in the Spirit. We're to be a light. We're to be an example. We're to love people like Christ loves us. Very important. I just want you to think for a second as we prepare to go to prayer that the real issue is self versus God. Am I caught up in selfishness and greed and and the desires of this world? Or am I caught up in following God learning more about him, growing in my walk with him. I mean, just think about it for a moment. If we put as much effort into the things of the world, into God, we wouldn't have to worry about all these things. We spend way more time being entertained by the things of this world than we do reading God's word, studying it, praying, spending time with him, listening to his voice, that still small voice inside of us, serving him, using our resources to benefit others. All those things God has called us to do. And when we live our life for God, we don't have to worry about self creeping in because what we focus on is what we become. So very important for us to think about this surrender thing. We either surrender to self or we surrender to God. Let's pray. As we go to prayer today, I just want you to think about Christ. Think about what he's done for you in your life if if you're a believer. Think about the transformation. As the worship team sang 
today that we don't have to worry about being our old self, and we don't have to, because the power and presence of the Holy Spirit lives in us. And we can call on that power and that presence, that wisdom, that encouragement. So I encourage you today as we go to prayer to surrender yourself to God, not to this world. Put aside the selfishness of self and live for Jesus. Father God, we praise you and thank you so much that we are so blessed by your presence in our life that we're so blessed that we have your word that guides us, that gives us wisdom, that helps us to know right from wrong, that gives us moral boundaries, that gives us absolutes. And it was we see as we live our life for you, the rewards are amazing. Not only the rewards that we get right now, but the rewards that we will have forever and ever with you. So Lord, right now I pray in the name of Jesus for each and every person who's listening, that they would repent if they've been living for this world and for self. We thank you for your grace and your forgiveness that you give us. But Lord, I pray that we could step forward and begin to realize that this life is very short and that we need to pour ourselves into you and that we need to live for you and that we need to allow your will to guide ours. Lord, again, I just pray that you would be with our nation. There's so much going on, so much division. And Lord, I pray that we could come to unity in you and your church, the believers in this great nation and the believers in this world will step up and be that light to this hurting world. Lord, we love you and thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. Amen. I want to encourage you that next week we'll be in Ephesians chapter 6, and we are going to focus on the power of the armor of God in your life. And so I encourage you to read that, be prepared, and I look forward to being with you again next week. God bless you. Have a great day.